Okay, so thank you very much, uh, everybody, um, uh, for all joining us this evening. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my video that it just ensures that I don't have a, a break in uh, uh, connectivity because we've had a shocker in Pretoria today. All the Pretorians will know that. So I just want to ensure that we stay connected at all times. I'm going to be doing the introduction and then I'll hand over to Brad. And good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to all our SIPA members to the CPD event seminar hosted by Genoa and MC de Villiers Brokers. The ethics talks for this evening is informed consent, disclosure and record keeping this presented by yeah. Dr. Brad Byra. Um, as a strategic partner of a CIPA, it is our pleasure to inform you that Genoa and MC de Villiers Brokers have successfully secured a preferential medical malpractice premium for all non-procedural GPs of a CIPA. With individual underwriting, procedural GPs can also obtain a market-related quotation by completing the relevant application forms available on the CIPA website. I would encourage you to go directly to the website to download the relevant in indemnity application form, which is a shortened application form that we can look at offering you a bespoke solution. I now wish to introduce you to Dr. Brad Byra. Dr. Byra is a chiropractor and experienced legal advisor with multiple degrees achieved in South Africa, United States, and the UK. Brad is passionate about healthcare and has been involved in the private practice healthcare system development, insurance, and medical legal work for over 27 years, supporting practitioners around the world working to improve the quality of care environments and the pra for practitioners and their patients. He has been the proud member of the Genoa team for over three years and provides insights into the trends into the global and local professional indemnity market while acting as an external medical legal advisor to the Genoa policyholders and providing continuing professional development for Genoa and all its partners. And with that, I would like to say thank you, and I hope you enjoy the talk this evening. And it's over to you, Brad. Thank you very, very much for the time you're affording us. Thank you, Jeanette, and, and hello to everyone. It's very much a pleasure to be here with you. Um, this is the beginnings of our year. It's February, and so we, we are back in the swing of things, as it, as it were, uh, in terms of CPD. I'm in Cape Town, so I don't know how many of you are from uh, around the, the city of Cape Town, how many of you are in KZN, how many of you are in the rest of the, of the provinces, but it's a very nice evening here, and so greetings to you. As we go forward, and, and, and we're now going towards effectively our third year of online CPD, I wanted to start by saying this presentation is going to be a little bit more lighthearted than they were last year and the year before, because... When we get feedback, I have people saying to me, you know what, practice is so hard already. Can we just get the context right and, and make it a little bit um, less intense? So I'm going to try and do that tonight. I'm going to take you back to the 1940s and then back to the 1920s and then into, into current practice. What I found is if you've got questions, I'll try and answer them in real time. So if you can put them onto the chat box. I see a uh, good evening from KZN and hi to everyone. If you put your questions onto the chat box as we speak. Your question is probably the same as many others questions and I'll be able to answer in real time. What we're gonna to do today is we're gonna look at informed consent and record keeping and disclosure within both the context of our daily clinical practices and um, knowing how difficult it is to, to manage our caseload with our patient obligations, with the kind of contemporaneous records that we need to do. But we're also gonna look at which acts of legislation and regulations you need to be most aware of because practically you need to be aware of all of them and there's 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 a saying that say ignorance is no defense of the law and that's true for this as well but i'm also going to share with you some of the experiences what's going on locally and internationally in terms of best practices some contact um, contested cases and i'll i'll share with you as we go but i wanted to start by saying Time has fundamentally changed in, in, in our world. We're still doing what we were doing in terms of being passionate about care. But the social context in which we're doing it has fundamentally changed. So I wanted to show you, and you'll see some, some slides and cartoons come up through this, how our world has fundamentally changed. 
And, and the first is, this is a, a two adverts on cigarettes from the 1950s. The one we can see more doctors smoke camel than any other cigarettes. And they talk about this T zone being the, the taste and the throat and the tongue. And we now know in hindsight that those are very vulnerable areas. And if you are a heavy smoker, your, your, your mouth, your throat and your tongue are very uh, susceptible to, to the less desirable outcomes of, of smoking. But also you see what we would never see nowadays is pictures of the babies, one saying, before you scold me, mom, maybe you better light up a Marlboro. Um, you never need to feel oversmoked. And gee, dad, you're always getting the best of everything, even Marlboro. So we look at this and we say, now, is this the kind of thing, unfiltered and, and, and tiny filtered cigarettes, that we would see in, our, in, in, in endorsements now? And we know the answer to that, because now at the bottom of, of any advert on very few that we do see, it says smoking kills, smoking causes cancer. And so the world has changed in terms of perception. When we look at that in terms of vaccination, we look at a, a vaccination advert from uh, smallpox. So we, we're going back to the 1940s and the 1950s, where they say the smallpox vaccine virus, the kind that takes and with no ill effects, all cattle first tested with um, the, the product, and then only virus awarded a gold medal at the World Fair. You can get it from, from that address. You can now see coming out from, um, from uh, Vaxidate, tracking your child's vaccination using your app. So the journey in clinical practice of how vaccines went from the, the, the posters stuck on, on a piece of wood on the side of a wall or a side of a telephone pole to, to having your app and your free app to help you check your child's vaccinations has come a long way. And it's come a significant way. I'm gonna share with you smallpox, measles, a little bit on meningitis and, and COVID just as graphics. And then the, the, the uh, curious one is, we know that one TV advert by Elvis Presley increased the vaccination rates for polio by almost threefold. So here we look at, at um, smallpox. This cartoon was from 1940. Some of you, and I, I'm not taking a position in this discussion around va uh, vaccine efficacy because that takes us down a whole different journey. But you'll see there the, the, the prejudice, the anti-vaccinists, -vac uh, the faddists, Mr. Careless and anti-everything and misinformation is not dissimilar to what we challenged with in, in, in the time where we are now. And, and so your practices are directly and indirectly affected by those persons who are pro-vaccine on the one side and anti-vaccine on the other side and the information that sits in the middle. And to a certain extent, you have what's called vicarious liability because if you are pro-vaccine and the person that you're consulting is anti-vaccine or vice versa, you catch yourself in a very in enviable position where an outcome that's adverse on either side could have a personal injury attorney point and say, well, doctor, this was your decision. This was your advice. And so here we look at anti-vaccine. Vaccines are dangerous. Spread the word. And of course, you've got um, the Grim Reaper then saying, well, my word is, is, is measles. And we know the, the, the severity of trying to, to reduce these, what we now call fundamentals, right? Your measles, mumps, and, 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 and rubella vaccinations. Uh, yellow fever, when I was traveling a lot, the issue of of vaccine passports wasn't an issue. If you didn't have your yellow fever vaccine, you couldn't come back into the country and you stayed in international immigration in international areas till you went to the travel clinic and got va vaccinated. So this one is a little bit busy. And for those of you, I'll, I'll share it, but there's the uh, daughter dancing and it says, every time she dances, I'm more thankful for all the wonderful thing doctors can do. And the other woman is saying, I know how you feel, why just think what meningitis meant when we were children. And so there's no question that, that the, the, um, the journey that we've taken, the improvements that, that, that uh, medical science has made with medical devices, with monitoring, with our access to information has fundamentally changed things. But in fundamentally changing the way we do our practice, it's also fundamentally changed the amount of access to information, both our colleagues, and our patients potentially have. There was a time where I, I, I used to put up a sign that said, my 
medical experience trumps your Dr. Google because people would go and they would read up. And I don't know how many of you working in the digital world have a patient come in and say, well, doc, thanks for seeing me. I actually Googled my signs and my symptoms and I think it's this and I want this kind of care. So you might be nodding or smiling, but, but very much we're seeing that. And equally, if you've got Medscape or you've got um, your, your, your MIMS and your Merck manual on, on your digital technologies now, it's much easier to be able to go and find information than it was my, my Merck manual, his Merck manual from 1999. And when I got it, I also got the Merck manual from 1899. Both of them still sit on my desk and they're great fun to look at, but neither of them are as effective as my, um, my web browser is now. And why I bring that up is because when we look at, at Medscape's malpractice survey from, from last year, and we look at the 22 odd thousand um, cases that they reviewed, we can see on the one side that failure to diagnose or your delayed diagnosis or complications from your treatment to your surgery or poor outcomes and disease progression by far make up the majority of reasons for the lawsuit. So there's no question about that. When we look at the other side, you'll notice that poor documentation of, of, of the patient's instructions and their education or errors in emissions in terms of, of medication or improperly obtained or, or, or a lack of informed consent is very seldom the reason for the lawsuit. But in almost all cases that you can see on the left-hand side of the failures, complications, and outcomes, the absence of documentation and the absence of consent leads one into a position where it's almost impossible to defend your position. And so this discussion today is not about how to do your clinical work better, it's to simply say, using the background of the, of, of the pictures that I showed you earlier, that the society's behavior, the fundamental fabric of our society has changed in how we need to be aware and we need to transact. So I'm new to clinical practice. I started seeing patients for the first time in 1993. And I, I, I sat with a colleague this evening who was telling me about a case that, that they're concerned about and this colleague was saying, well, when do I notify and when don't I notify? And they told me the story and I said, well, have you got all of your notes and all of your telephone calls and all of your WhatsApp records reduced into your clinical notes? Now, I don't know about you, but my clinical notes are, are, are digital now. I use a digital system. I have a colleague who said, you have to take my pen out my cold dead fingers before I stop taking written notes. So there's a little bit of both. But the message that's come out through the malpractice surveys is whilst people don't sue you or take action against you because you didn't get good consent and they don't take action against you because of poor documentation, you lose your matter because you don't have the documentation to substantiate your position. And that's a very big deal. And later on, I might talk to you about a, um, a condition that happened with a, with a young child who went to Red Cross Children's Hospital. And everything I'm sharing with you are matters of, of public record, and I can share the cases with you for those of you that would like to read them. But when we start defining consent, there's a couple of, 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 of things that you need to know. Now we need to be saying to our patient, which therapy would you prefer? These are the benefits to those therapies. These are the harms to those therapies. These are the risks to those therapies. And the HPCSA says if there's a 1% chance of risk, you need to share that with your patient. Obviously, the more chance of risk, the more you, you need to share with them. But you, you'll know, and, and, and I've had this experience as recently as today, where the patient says, I don't want to hear about these risks. It's too scary. Not interested. The challenge that you've got is you've got to say to them, well, I respect that. But in terms of booklet three of, of, of the HPCSA ethical guidelines, which is the National Patients' Rights Charter, you're obligated to tell them and they're obligated to hear. But equally, there's a balance between your obligation to tell them and their obligations to fully disclose um, in terms of, of, of what they've come in with. So we're gonna to talk today a, a little bit about the National Health Act, specifically when it comes to consent, section six and seven. So again, if, if you like to read, pull out the National Health Act and have a look at section six and seven. And then in terms of the HPCSA ethical guidelines, you need to look at the natural duties and your moral obligations and institutional and legal duties contained in booklets one and how to apply inform, informed consent 
as an ongoing process. And I think that's a key issue here is when we talk about informed consent, we're not only talking about the singular first intake discussion that you have with a patient. You need to consider that informed consent is everything you do and say with that patient from the beginning of your consultation to the end of your treatment regime on an each and every presentation basis. So it's not, well, I took consent to treat once and that consent is there all the time. Every time you see that patient, you don't necessarily have to sign new consent forms, but you need to have the conversations with them and realize that informed consent is iterative and ongoing. We often forget that and then we lose that. Um, if you don't know the National Patient Rights Charter, I'm gonna strongly recommend that you download it. And if you don't have access to it, you're not sure where to go, it's in booklet three of the um, HPCSA guidelines. And that's a, a small 108, uh, 384 page book that you can uh, download off the HPCSA website. If you still can't find it, you're welcome to get a hold of me and I'll, I'll share it with you. And then obviously, well, not obviously, but uh, booklet four, read with, with booklets five and booklets nine of the, um, of the guidelines on seeking um, patients informed consent are important for you to read. So when we look at informed consent, we need to look at it in terms of initially that consent is the expression of will by any person. And in order to get permission, informed consent is the process of getting that permission before doing any intervention, whether it's an assessment, a treatment or a procedure. And it's also important now more than ever in terms of disclosing personal information. Now, we're not gonna to talk too much about POPI or the Protection of Personal Information Act or PIA, which is the Promotion of Access to Information Act. But you do need to bear in mind that when you're asking a patient to consent to therapy or providing it, or you're asking, and we'll go through this a little later as well, for the use of that information, you need to be able to say to them, what information, that's personal information, is being collected? With whom or who are you sharing it with? Why are you collecting it, using it, or disclosing it? And what are the potential risks and harms of doing it? So if you're collecting information from your patient regarding a condition that you may or may not want to share with a secondary person or a tertiary care practitioner, so referring it either for surgical intervention or for rehabilitation, so either to, to, to a surgeon of your choice or to a um, physiotherapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, podiatrist, anyone else in, in your network, you need to be able to say to this, the, this patient, when I collect this information, I'm going to store it digitally, I'm going to store it in my records, but I need to share this appropriately as clinically required with the people I need to do it to. Because you, you can't share information anymore without letting the patient know what you're sharing. And you also can't provide healthcare without that patient's informed consent. And that's not new. That's already since 2003. So that's 19 odd years in terms of this National Health Act, but ultimately this goes down to 1924. It says anytime you do something to a patient without their being aware of it and giving you permission that could have a permanent outcome is at times considered to be assault. So um, somewhere in the, in the rest of the presentation, there'll be more pictures and, and, and jovial things. I just wanna test with you if there's any questions as we go, because we're going to now go in and just talk a little bit about what defines um, informed consent. And you'll see on the, on the left-hand side there, the patient's knowing choice about a medical treatment or a procedure made after the healthcare professional, physician or healthcare provider discloses whatever information a reasonably prudent provider in the medical community would give. Now I've underlined that and I'd like to, you to remember this for later, because recently that has changed. So in the Black's Law Directory, now we're only going back seven years, this was the definition. It said, what would you as the reasonably prudent provider share with a patient regarding their risks? So peg that for now. And also bear in mind that when we talk about this, we talk about it in terms of what's called the reasonable person's test. So if something untoward were, were to, to happen, either foreseeable or unforeseeable or preventable or a known complication that leads to an adverse outcome for the patient, either psychologically, physiologically, or physically. 
I call those the three Ps. So the harm can be psychological harm, physiological harm, or physical harm, or a combination of those three. Now, if you act in a manner that a reasonable practitioner with the same or similar training to you would have done in a same or similar circumstance, getting a same or similar outcome is referred to as the reasonable person's test. So as you go through your daily um, clinical work, and as you start thinking about this, ask yourself, what would another person with the same or similar training do that compared to what I'm doing now? And am I being that reasonably prudent provider? And often when we see a dispute between the patient and the patient's family and the provider, the issue is, were you being reasonable? Or were you doing what your peers might have done in a similar circumstance? Now, that's not a perfect world by any means. But um, we need to bear in mind that when we start considering informed consent, that principle of to a willing person injury is not done needs to be followed. So whatever you do must be recognized by law. Now, part of the reason for putting up the vaccination slides um, a little earlier is because when we started doing telemedicine, Telemedicine became telehealth with a change in the regulations in response to COVID. And the HPCSA's guidance note was quite clear. It said telehealth will remain for as long as COVID remains a um, disaster management um, priority, after which time we will reassess what can and can't be done. So sometimes it's not always clear as to what is recognized by law and what is not against good morals. So contra bonus mores is against good morals. So you also have to make sure that the consent that you get is given by a person capable with both the intention and understanding in, in terms of law. So when you, if you treat a lot of, of, of children, you need to be aware of this under the age of 18 and under the age of 12, because the definition of which child is precocious and not precocious and who understands and who doesn't understand is quite important. It's also become increasingly important in families where the parents are divorced and there's joint custody. Because in certain circumstances, you need to make sure that you're getting consent from both parents before you treat that child. If you're providing psychological counseling or if you're providing an intervention that's a procedure, you may need consent from both parents. They may not be willing to give consent. And then you've got a different issue in terms of who is capable in law to provide consent for that child? And is that child old enough and capable enough to provide their own consent? They also need to not only have the knowledge and awareness of the extent of the potential harm and risk, but they also need to appreciate and understand the consequences of that risk. And they need to consent to the harm or assume the risk. So if you're doing a procedure where you're cutting the skin, it's consent or piercing the skin, you're consenting to the harm. If you're prescribing medicines for them, they're assuming the risk. And so those are two very different things that you need to be aware of. When, you pre when you're prescribing meds, you need to be able to make sure that you're recording the meds and that you're following up in terms of the WHO's guidelines on safe medication practices. So your, your consent needs to be clear, needs to be unequivocal, and you need to proceed uh, with the conduct in question as it needs to be done. You also need to make sure that what you do doesn't exceed what is permissible with the consent that's given. So if you're doing one thing and you say, well, I need your consent because I wanna make a small incision in the skin and I wanna remove A, B or C or drain D, E or F. And you also find something else that you just do at the same time. And you haven't discussed it with the patient. You're now proceeding outside of consent. And many of you might be shrugging your shoulders and say, come on, this is what we do every day. And I'm saying, absolutely. The difference is now you have a whole profession of personal injury attorneys who are looking for the opportunity to take exception to what you do every day and exploit that for the benefits. I, and I do think sometimes to, to the secondary benefit of the patient and to the primary benefit of, of their own earnings. And so there's a little bit of attention that you need to be aware of there. So when we look at it in terms of the National Health Act, you've heard a lot, especially recently in terms of the vaccination debate around chapter two of the constitution, which is the Bill of Rights, 
that talks about the security in and control of one's body. And it speaks around section um, 12, everyone has the right to be free from all forms of violence from either public or private sources. Now, that could be considered that when you do a procedure without consent, that you are perpetrating a form of violence against that individual. You also have to bear in mind that the, the, constitu the constitution affords bodily and, physiolog and, and physiological and psychological integrity, which includes the right to security in and control of their body. And so the minute they come into you, they splitting their rights of control and they, they conferring some of those rights to you. But you need to make sure that the user has full knowledge. Now the National Health Act doesn't talk about patients, they talk about users. And that becomes important because the Consumer Protection Act doesn't talk about the doctor and the patient. They talk about the service provider, you, the practitioner, and the consumer, the patient. And so work that you do where you're the provider of the service and the patient is the consumer of the service sometimes means that you could also be held accountable for outcomes for a procedure that you've done or a suture that you've used or a product that you've used or a medical device that you're using that gives an outcome that's less desirable than what it was intended. So I, I, I'm saying this to you because whilst we still have the same beneficent philanthropy of what we want to do with our patients, the world around us has changed. And because of that, understanding your requirements in terms of, of section 6.1 and certain 6.2 becomes important. And I say um, section 6.2, because it's expected that when you inform the patient, the user of what you're going to do and what the outcomes are, are likely to be, you need to do it in a language that they understand and in a manner that's consistent with their level of, of, of literacy. Why do I say that? How is because I don't know about you, but I often have a patient who says, this is overwhelming information. It's too much for me. I can't think my brain is full. There's too much. I say, okay, now let's pause. Let's go through this again. But the question that I'm asking you is, do you afford enough time to fully explain things to your patients in a manner that they or their immediate partners or parents can understand. Because if you're not and something then goes wayward, the question that the, the, the attorney would be asking you from the other side is, did the person understand what you said to them? Did you test to make sure that they understood or did you speak about it in a manner and then go on regardless of, of, of how they felt? So in terms of section seven, um, you must always get consent unless they're unable to give consent. And if they're unable to give consent, consent needs to be given by other persons. And the other persons would be their spouse or their partner, their life partner, then their parent, then their grandparent, then an adult child, then a brother or sister in that order. Or as authorized by the court. Now, it's unlikely in, in daily practice that you're going to ever be met with a court order telling you what you have to do or giving consent to do a procedure because the patient is unable to do so. And I suppose the only time you're ever likely to get that in, in, in daily clinical practice outside of an institutional facility is where the person is intellectually disabled or severely uh, incapacitated. There's also a section in terms of the consent that you need to be aware of is that you don't need consent if your failure to treat will result in a serious risk either to public health or that any delay to treat would result in health in, in, in a health issue that could lead to death or irreversible damage to that person's health. So there are exceptions. I don't generally find those exceptions are there in, in, in daily clinical practice where you have a walk-in private practice. Certainly this becomes um, more, um, more, more critical if you're working in the emergency rooms. If you have an after hour patient, if you have a crisis, if you're responding um, to a roadside emergency, then section seven becomes a lot uh, more meaningful for you. And I, I do suggest if that's the case, that you do keep, um, you keep mindful of that. So if you are going to do Good Samaritan work, if you do emergency room work, if you see people after hours, bear in mind that these are, are, are certain of the, of the consequences that are important for you. Also bear in mind, 
that it's your obligation to take all reasonable steps. And there's that word reasonable again, all reasonable steps to obtain the user's informed consent. Now, if the person's unconscious or you can't get hold of their next of kin, and you are fearful that their life is in danger, or that they may experience um, irreversible harm, or that they may cause harm to others, then by all means act in accordance, but then document as such. So informed consent in terms of Section 7 of the National Health Act says consent for the provision of a specified health service given by a person with the legal capacity to do so, who has been informed in terms of what we've discussed before. And the key words there for me are specified health service. You need to be able to explain what it is you're doing. And sometimes when we have a, a, a a notification come through where you as the practitioner are worried and you say, look, I'm, I'm worried because I, I did this with this patient. They had a vagovasal response or they had an anxiety response or they had an anaphylactic response or there was pus and an infection as, as a consequence of what I did. Then I said, well, show me your consent form. And sometimes where it says informed consent, there's simply a word next to it that says yes. Well, yes to what? Because the minute you don't have a well-specified health service in your consent, it means that it's very difficult when you get challenged to show that you did do the consent that you needed to do. So it's not only about doing the consent, recording that you've done the consent is important. You can have pre-printed forms. What you shouldn't be doing is having your receptionist or your office administrator have that consent form completed in the waiting room before the patient sees you, because then it's not informed consent. Then it's general consent. And the patient can argue and say, yes, but I signed that for the receptionist. I didn't know you were gonna do this. And had I known, I wouldn't have said yes. So the, those issues are important. And it comes up with, with, these, um, with these two updates. So the first update came in, in 2015, and it's, you can read it in the British Medical Journal in 2017, but you recall earlier on, on, on the Black's Law Directory that it said that the patient needs to be told what the prudent practitioner feels is relevant. After 2015, the, the, the courts found, and these were the UK courts, which then falls into common law, which also applies to us, that courts found that a patient should be told whatever they want to know not what you as the practitioner think they should be told. They also need to be told whatever a reasonable person in that patient's position would be likely to attach significance to the risk. Or the doctor is or should reasonably aware that that patient would attach significance to. So it's no longer enough in your consent for you to be saying to people what you think is important. You also have to try and guess what they think is important and answer that to them. Now, 2017, the jury is still out. That's only five years ago in terms of how that's changed. But that was a fundamental shift in informed consent from what was there, which was the Bolam uh, ruling, which predated this Montgomery ruling, which was the one that said that you as the, re the reasonable prudent practitioner makes the decisions. So be aware now, as you go back into practice, moving forward into this year, that not only is it what you think it's important, it's also what the patient attaches value and significance to. Finding that balance is, is, is a tricky balance to find. Crossing the Atlantic in 2017, there was a further challenge on informed consent. And this challenge went along the lines of saying that it's also the physician's duty, you, you as the healthcare professional, to provide information to the patient sufficient to obtain their consent. And you cannot delegate that to another person. Now, what this does, and this hasn't yet been tested, but potentially it leaves you and me and all other uh, practitioners vulnerable to legal action if we delegate the informed consent to another member of the team. So if you're getting a care administrator or a practice administrator or your receptionist to sign the consent form, you now are on the wrong side of, of a judgment in 2017, which also forms part of the common law, which also forms potentially um, part of our law. So if your patient now turns around and says, well, 
not only did I not get the consent in the manner that it should have been done, and not only did you not describe to me the relevance that I've attached significance to, but you didn't even do it. It was done by your receptionist or by your nurse or by somebody that wasn't you. We now have three points where the change in, in societal norm has made things uh, more challenging for us. So I hope this is making sense and, and I hope it's not making you feel overwhelmed. I, I worked with an ophthalmologist recently who come out of their recent um, legal defense experience. And I said to him, uh, what was the key issue? And, and I'm sharing this with his permission. I said, what was the key issue in learning that, that you, he took away from his journey? And he said, well, the, the two biggest things that he took away is the first is when you are being accused and you're standing before the court defending yourself, you stand alone. You only have your friends again when you're found to be um, not guilty or having uh, worked diligently and, and, and within the reasonableness. He said, but the second thing is that the informed consent journey is the entire consultation end to end. It doesn't begin and end with the signing of the document. It's all the explanations you do. So if you're doing a fundoscopic exam and then you're doing an otoscopic exam and you're looking in, in, in the throat and um, you, you're palpating the, the, the neck and you're doing other things, are you explaining to your patient what you're doing? If you're injecting some lignocaine and, and, and um, you're then going to do a small procedure, have you explained to the patient what you're doing? Do they understand this? Do they understand the, the risk of, of fainting, the vasovagal response? Do they understand the risk that somebody watching them might faint? And, and could lead to, to an undesirable outcome. So how you manage your practice in a safe and create a safe therapeutic environment has become as important as the clinical care that you give. Now, we might not like that. We might think that's silly. We might think that admin is nowhere near as important as clinical acumen, but our society is telling us different right now. And so as we go through these CPD journeys, this is part of the reason that we share them the, the, the way that we are. And so I share this with you. These, these are two pictures from the 50s. Um, the reason that I chose these two is because these are the two competing companies. Seven Up is part of the PepsiCo group. This cola is, is, is Coca-Cola. And both of them are saying, we've got the youngest customers in the business. But the second one is saying, it's not soon enough. Laboratory tests over the last years have proven that babies who start drinking soda during that early formative period have a much higher chance of gaining acceptance and fitting in during those awkward preteen and teen years. Can you imagine if we said stuff like this now? So do your child a favor, start them on a strict regime of soda and other sugary carbonated beverages right now for a lifetime of guaranteed happiness and or diabetes and or metabolic disease. So what was normal, and what is normal are quite different. So the, the, the question is with telehealth medicine, does giving consent via an app count? My answer is in the main, it does count, but you have to have some kind of record to show that consent was given. So if you're doing telehealth and you're doing virtual consultations, are you recording your consultation? And if you're recording them, does your patient know that you're recording them? Because you need permission to record the consultations. So yes, you could say, this is a verbal consent. I'm sharing it with you. Do you understand it? This is being recorded. You can do it on, on um, for example, WhatsApp. But if you're running consent on WhatsApp, understand that you've got two types of WhatsApp. You've got WhatsApp personal and WhatsApp business. Which one are you using? Does your patient know that you're gonna communicate with them on a social media platform, that that platform is considered to be broadcasting, that there's the risk that somebody else might read or see that. And so you need to be able to share all of those, those, those risks. So digital health is changing our world of consultation fundamentally, just like it's changing this discussion that we're having tonight. So you still need consent. You still need it preferably to be written so you might want to say to the person, I'm doing this, I'm sending you a WhatsApp as, 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 as patient. So doctor, you're sending to Brad this, Brad needs to write back. I consent to the discussion and the procedures that we're doing as discussed during my consultation with you today. And then you record that and then you need to translate that into the patient records. Obviously, 
we can overkill this and make ourselves a, a little bit crazy, which is not the goal. But it does also speak, and I, I'm going to speak about it a little bit later when we talk about record keeping. It does speak to case law. So the case law on why we need consent starts off in our country 99 years ago with Stoffberg versus or V. Elliott, where any bodily interference without restraint of a man's person and is not justified in law, is not consented to, is a wrong. So the language is slightly different, but if we don't get permission to do anything, it's considered wrong. So in Castile versus De Grief, that was in, in, in 1994, it's your duty to disclose the material risks and your failure to do so constitutes assault and not negligence. So now we separate out. If you don't get consent and you do a, a procedure, that's considered assault even if you did the procedure correctly. If you left out something or did it improperly, that's negligence and that's a separate issue. That's an issue of competence, whether the other one is an administrative issue of rights. Now, the question that was, was raised in 2006 was the issue of what degree of risk should be disclosed to the patient. And in, in one of the, the early court cases of, 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 of the uh, 1970s, if you disclose the risks, you may render yourself liable for the action of assault. But if you don't disclose them, you might frighten the patient into not having the operation. So you, you've, you've got this thing, if you disclose one way, you're in trouble, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, but you have to work this through. You also have to, to recognize that your patient, who's then the plaintiff or their attorney, has to demonstrate that you intentionally didn't obtain informed consent. Nowadays, simply the fact that you didn't do it where you know you should could be considered intentionally not doing it. In the 2006 judgment of McDonald v. Rowe, no informed consent is regarded as a violation of the patient's right to their bodily integrity. So we can see that your documentation and your discussions with your, um, with your patients is important and it, it doesn't go away. So when you look at, at uh, your general ethical uh, rules, which is book two, your main responsibilities is to respect your patient to respect their confidentiality, privacy, and choices and dignity, to provide them with enough information to make the choices, and except in emergencies, get informed consent from the patient in as clear, unequivocal, and comprehensive way as you can. So those are my comments on, on, on consent. And if I was to summarize it for you, your key considerations in consent is you need to share the details of the um, condition. You need to share the details of any investigation and treatment options that you're going to do. You also need to share the costs and financial implications because often the patient is very happy with you until they get their bill. Then they're less happy with you. And now, especially as of last year, June, when the Poppy Act came into full effect. Now, the Poppy Act, the Protection of Personal Information Act, is an act from 2013. So it took eight years for us to get ready for it to be fully um, operational or, or coming to full effect. But by this stage, no one can say they don't understand what the protection of personal information means, what personal information is, and how you deal with it. So now, up until two, three years ago, your key considerations were, what's wrong with you? Well, firstly, what do I think it is? My diagnostic opinion is, the prognosis is, this is what we're going to do for further investigation and treatment. These are the costs. And now this is the information I'm keeping. This is where I may need to share it. This is where I may want to share it. You may have a m, &M meeting. You may have a, a clinical group that you want to share it with. And I recall very, very clearly recently being able to go and, and, and sit with a group of people and they would put up, they would describe a case and then they would put up the imaging and then we'd talk about the case. But that imaging almost always had the patient's name on it. Now, anytime you share information that the patient can be recognized by in any way, shape or form, whether it's a tattoo or an image or their name or their geography or their ID number, you need to be aware that you possibly in um, contravention of Poppy. So 
let's talk about the joy of medical records. The joy of medical records is required under booklet nine. And it's defined as any relevant record that's made by you at the time of or subsequent to a consultation and or the examination and or the application of health management. All of those become part of a, a health record. Now, I, I mentioned to you earlier about the case at the Red Cross Children's Hospital. What happened is this young boy fell down, he's six years old, he falls down on carpeted stairs, hits the back of his head. Two hours later, his dad comes home, his mom says, look, he's still a bit grumpy, goes off to see um, the emergency room uh, docs at, at Red Cross Children's Hospital. Now, this is where the contention happens because he's lucid, his scores are good, he's um, fully attentive, his, his, his pupils are pearl, they are equal and responsive to light, he's equal and responsive, his neurology and his neuro neurological assessments are good, he has a bump at the back of his head. Goes home, a couple of hours later, he's tired, he sleeps in the back of the car, he sleeps in the bed with his folks, at three in the morning, his dad can't wake him up. At four in the morning, he wets his bed and he, he has a seizure and it finds, he finds that there's a linear fracture and um, the bleed has left him permanently uh, cerebral palsy, severely compromised. This is a lawsuit that takes seven years to resolve. The expert witness says, the cold words of the record, says the judge, is the only factual basis that the court has to ascertain the accuracy and detail of the examination. One of the experts for the, the patient says, if it's not there, it wasn't done. And the whole argument hinges around whether this practitioner used the appropriate term of firm versus soft versus spongy in adding the detail to the tone of the bump. Her arguments were, these are my records as best I can do. And she had very good records. They were as contemporaneous as could reasonably be expected. And she said, if it, the bump was spongy, I would have written spongy. If it was soft, I would have written soft, but it was a bump by inference, it was firm. At the end of the day, and I say at the end of the day, because could you imagine the two things? One is that as an outcome of not doing a, a, a scan that wasn't necessarily indicated at the time of examination, you have a patient who's now permanently disabled and a family that's permanently impaired socially and, and intimately as a result. But equally, you've been through this litigation process for so many years. The emotional toll is profound. So all I can say to you about medical records is bear in mind that this is a settlement case that came through on the 31st of, of, of July 2020. So it's very contemporary. And these are the phrases used, the cold words of the record. If it's not there, it's not done. So any relevant record, relevant record, now relevant and reasonable are the words that you've heard me talk about quite a lot today, form part of um, that health record. Now, what does it need to, to, to contain? You can check this in, in, in terms of, of, of booklet nine and you can review it, but handwritten contemporaneous notes and or now digital notes. All notes taken by previous practitioners need to be included and at very least referenced and type discharge summary notes if, you, if you're working on hospital work. You also need to keep all your referral letters to and from other healthcare practitioners, all your lab reports, all x-ray reports. Nowadays with PACS um, programs, it's slightly different. You're, if you're doing um, ECG, ECG or EEG traces, you need to keep those as well. All your audiovisual records, any photographs, videos, tape recordings, any clinical research and clinical trial data, any other forms, insurance forms. Some of you may do disability assessments and IOD forms uh, for COID. You may do forms in terms of insurance renewals. All of that forms part of your health record, and none of it is, is, is um, something that you should um, remove. Now, the question there is, what should be included. Now, part of the reason for this is you want to retain records and this, this is uh, largely self-explanatory. And this, this predates these lectures by many years. 
obviously for furthering diagnosis and ongoing management, conducting clinical audits. And my question to you is, do you conduct clinical audits? Nowadays, if you're keeping your records to promote teaching and research, you need copy permission from the patient to use their information for teaching and research purposes. Goes without saying for administrative and related, um, also for historical purposes. Again, if you're doing it for research, you need to have permission for that. Sadly, you need to now keep it as a direct evidence in litigation and for occupational injuries and diseases. So now you've got to ask the question and bear in mind that your records need to be kept for a minimum of six years after that patient becomes dormant. And that could go indefinitely if the patient is intellectually or, 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 or disabled. And it can go for 20 to 25 years if it's an occupational disease or injury that, that relates to that. Here's one of the things that I see often, and, and I, I'm just going to touch on this because it is section four. You need to bear in mind that um, any time you amend a record, you need to leave the previous note legible. You need to strike it out. You need to sign and date it. And preferably, when you've put in the amendment, explain why you did it. Because the, the 12 things that you need to have in the record is that patient's information, their biopsychosocial history, including idiosyncrasies and allergies, date, time, and place of each consultation, your SOAP note, the assessment of the condition, your proposed clinical management, medication and doses prescribed. You know that. And, and hopefully you're keeping those good um, medication records, the details of referrals. Now, the patient's reactions to treatment or medication, including side effects or adverse effects is something that you need to keep. And bear in mind that when I look at medication error and medication related issues, often the script that you've written, you haven't followed up the next day or the day after to see how the patient's feeling on that dose of meds. It's not only their responsibility to phone you and tell you, at your accountability to follow up with them. And then of course, test results, imaging investigations, um, if the patient has been booked off work with the reasons and written proof of informed consent. So those are all documents that you need to keep. We've spoken about the retaining of records. Um, for minors, they need to be kept until their 21st birthday. Obviously because of the, the rule of prescription, after a patient turns 18, they have their own legal capacity to take an action against you that occurred when they were a minor. And they have three years from the date of becoming aware, in other words, the 18th birthday, to the prescription, which is 21. So the very shortest length of time that you should keep your records is until each patient turns 21 or for six years after you've seen them last. Now that's a long time. And if you've got paper records, you need to keep them and preserve them in a manner that um, is retrievable. So you may need to keep them off site, but then you may need to be able to retrieve them as and when. So a question that I sometimes get asked is say, well, I work in three different practices and I see the same patient in different practices. Where do I keep the records? My answer is you need to keep a comprehensive set of records for that patient in each area that you see them. Because you don't have a didactic memory where you can remember in each and every patient what you did two or three or four consultations ago. So I'm aware that we are rolling back on time. So I'm going to only keep us another two or three minutes. Bear in mind that any healthcare provider needs to provide a, a person over the age of 12 with a copy or an abstract or access to their records in terms of the Children's Act. And any patient under the age of 18, the guardian may have uh, application for access to those records, but the patient has to give you permission. So there are still certain rules in terms of the Access to Information Act and the Children's Act, that if you're treating children, you need to be sensitive to their rights of, of, of um, privacy as well. So I'm not gonna talk a lot about others in terms of uh, choice of pregnancy, I am going to say that no healthcare practitioner shall make any information available to any third party without the written authorization of a patient or a court order. So often I get asked the question, well, can I share information? I say, yes, if the patient has, has, has told you they can, not on a WhatsApp, not on a phone call, 
in a written form to tell you to do so. And you can see that, that there is more than enough precedent to do that. I wanted to share this um, with you just as a, a, as a little bit of humor. Um, when I shared these. Brad, before you end, that you must remember there's one uh, question for you that hasn't been answered, okay, on the chat facility. With okay. Tele um, uh, with telehealth medicine, does giving consent via an app count? Yes, and, and so as, as we go through this now, you can see on the, on the previous slides, when you start looking at disclosure, the important thing, and, and I'll, 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 I'll end with that, is that your records need to be complete and consistent. You should avoid making personal notes about your opinion about people. Standardized formats should be used wherever possible. And copies of records should only be released after receiving proper authorizations. You need to keep your billing records separate from patient care records. And this is quite important if, as we go through this journey of forensic audits now, your billing notes are different from your clinical notes. And you don't need to... Um, you, you need to bear in mind that, that, that both of them have separate implications and you don't have to share your clinical notes with your billing notes. They are audited separately for different reasons. So the, the question here is what about patient changing healthcare practitioner and requesting their, their record? Absolutely, the patient can request their record and you can send a copy of that record to the other practitioner, but you still have to keep the copy. You have to keep an original and share a copy with them. Or you can give them the original and keep a copy for you. So you still have to keep your notes even whilst you're sharing them. So any patient can say to you, I want a copy of my notes with the greatest of pleasure. But notwithstanding the copy of those, the, that you're giving away a copy, you're still obliged to keep it yourselves because the, 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 the records actually belong to the patient. They don't belong to us. But our obligations are to, to keep for posterity and continuity the, um, the records as they needed. So I wanna just go back without causing too much chaos. So the, the answer to the question on, on, on telehealth is not a clear answer because we haven't tested it yet. The, the, the telehealth that we're doing is still nascent. We're still learning about it, but you can see as we've gone through the requirements for consent, the requirements for, for, for record keeping is whatever you're doing with that patient needs to match those requirements. So if you need consent and that consent needs to be unequivocal and it needs to be detailed and the patient needs to acknowledge it prior to you doing what you do, you need to make sure that if you're having a dialogue like this, it needs to be a dialogue. And I would say to you, um, Jeanette, if I may use you as, as, as my patient just for a moment. So Jeanette, I'm going to recommend that we do this procedure in this way. It's got these side effects, but I need your consent. And since we're doing this virtually, I can't get your written consent. So I need, as a part of this recording, for you to say to me, Brad, I understand what, what you're suggesting, and I'm consenting to the procedure, and I understand its risks. And that's a bit laborious and there's a little bit of tongue tiedness to that, but that's the nature of the circumstance of how we're working at the moment. So at this point, I, I want to hand um, the discussion, Jeanette, back to you and say, if any of my colleagues who, who are on the call now have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them for a few minutes. Um, notwithstanding, I want to say thank you very much for listening to me on what I know is a, a contentious and slightly difficult. Brad, I just want to say thank you very, very much uh, personally for the exceptional presentation tonight. We appreciate your time, your experience, and um, the examples that you shared with everyone this evening. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And more importantly, I want to thank the audience for your unwavering attention to the presentation this evening. You're welcome to ask a few questions. And if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank all the members of ASAPA. And thank you, Dr. Anman Pillay, for being part of the meeting this evening. Um, we really look forward to doing a lot of someone. Uh, Dr. Pillay has his hand up. <laughs> yes, Dr. Pillay. Thanks, Jeanette. No, I just wanted to say, Brad, it's always a great lecture. And uh, obviously, um, thanks for, for making time. So I've got uh, two questions, really. The one on consent is, so 
for procedures, fantastic. I think we, we have a clear understanding from the talk. But a lot of the things we do in practice are the minor things, like the intravascular injections or the things that we do, which you normally wouldn't get consent. But those are the ones that you might get an allergic reaction to or an anaphylaxis. Mm -hmm. What is the process for your normal consult, not necessarily a procedure for a circumcision or something like that? I mean, those consents, you know, we don't get a consent every time we give a diclofenic injection. Well, that's, that's where I think the world is, has slightly changed. So if we were to, to regard the, the injection being a bored needle with penetration through the skin, we would say, well, what are the reactions that we might expect? We could expect a vasovagal reaction. We could expect the patient to faint. We could expect there to be nausea and they might throw up because of the experience of, of, of being uh, mildly, moderately phobic. And we, we could expect there to be an anaphylactic reaction. We could expect them afterwards to maybe have sight tenderness. We could expect them maybe to have some, some bleeding. And as small as the risk is, there might be a risk that they get a subcutaneous infection. Would it be reasonable to say that? Yes, absolutely. And if it's, re if it's reasonable to say that, you can have a form that says, this is the consent form for intramuscular or subcutaneous injections. And you say to your patient, listen, I know you know this, but given the, the, the world we live in at the moment, anytime I do anything to you that um, pierces your skin or puts you in a potential uh, point where you could faint, you could have an allergic reaction, you could get a small uh, infection that could lead to a cyst or it could lead to anything else, I'm obligated to tell you about it because I'm a thorough practitioner and I want you to know that I'm taking you seriously. And so because of that, I'm going to ask you to... to, to uh, acknowledged with, with consent and it's just a signature on the form and we won't do this for every um, time we, we, we give you an anti-inflammatory or, or an intramuscular but if you come in for a new condition in six months I might just refresh your memory. Okay so I guess then the question is because this is not something we do routinely because it's informed consent so it's not part of your T's and C's but you can do it for the first injection of every patient that could last the lifetime of the patient in practice? Yeah, I, I, would, I would say yes and no. I would say if you haven't seen the patient for six months or a year, when they come in again, refresh it. So, so if, if I see, and, and interestingly, I had a patient who came in on the 4th of December, 2020. I saw them again on the 4th of December, 2021, and I didn't see them in the year between that. But a lot changes in a person's life in, 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 in 12 months. A lot changes in our lives. So if you haven't seen a patient for a reasonable period of time, and, and, and generally we're talking about a, a period of longer than six months. If you haven't seen the patient in longer than six months, you're naturally going to be asking them, so how are you? What's changed? How are you doing? Is there anything I need to be aware of? Have you had any allergic reactions? What's changed in, in, in your life? Why are you here? At the same time, you may say, listen, as part of good practice, I need to just go back with you through the things that, that, that we need to do so that you're aware of it. It takes maybe a minute or two. You've got the forms pre-printed, so it's not really a hardship anymore. And you, you could judge what that duration of time is, once a year, every six months, every two years. I can't suggest it because we don't have a precedent yet. Sorry, Brad, I've got one more hand up with another question, if we can just quickly ask. Um... Of course. Doctor, one non zombie. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Doctor, for so informative uh, presentation. Uh, I'm working in the public sector and I'm, I'm doing maternity. So, one of the challenges that we come across is that uh, when I'm I'm having an emergency uh, section on a, a minor uh, lady uh, and I don't have, who actually cannot give consent for operation and we cannot reach the, the, the parent. So what we do, we call our superintendent uh, on call. So usually they will let us go ahead and say that you can sign on their behalf on the, on the form. So how, well, my question now is, am I really protected or covered on such, uh, in such cases? Because we come across such uh, 
scenarios a lot in the public sector. Uh, that's my concern. Thank you. So, so that's a slightly different debate because we're now talking about national healthcare and we're talking about this at institutional level. And we need to recognize that there are, there are mandates provided to the hospital administrators and superintendents that supersede the mandates that, that come to us. So we would defer upwards in, in, in the hierarchy of the hospital. And if, if there were to be a challenge later and you could demonstrate that whilst the family wasn't available to give consent, the minor understood the procedure, the superintendent gave consent on behalf of the family as a organ of state or, or as a function of, of, of leadership, then that would be reasonable. If you didn't approach the superintendent and went without that, that, that structure, I suspect that there would be more difficulty. But I can't answer that fully without um, more information. Okay, thank you. Uh, I see there's one more last question, Brad, if you're willing to take it from Tanya, if you don't mind. Of course. Tanya? Oh, thank you, Doctor. Thank you for a wonderful um, session. I just want to refer back to Dr. Spillay's uh, uh, question with regards to the time period, because if there's a medical um, case, uh, the patient is going to refer that he wasn't informed uh, in a reasonable period. And because there's no president at the moment uh, stating the time period, it's always going to, going to stay an issue because the one party is going to say, say that I wasn't updated and the doctor is going to say, okay, but I had the period of six months. So how, how will you then as a doctor actually approach a case like that? Because the patient is just going to say, no, but you needed to notify me. And the doctor needs to keep track of that notification within the period. So, so let's, let's apply the reasonable person test to this. My, my principle would, would be, every time a patient comes in for a different type of complaint where you may do something with them, to them, that hasn't been done with them, to them before, mm -hmm. you would reasonably be expected to explain the procedures and get consent. If they're coming in for the same or similar condition with what you've treated with them before, you can reasonably um, assume that they have an understanding of the procedure that you refresh. And for that, if you went back and you looked at the uh, National Patient Rights Charter, mm -hmm. those rights and obligations are reciprocal. The patient has the rights and responsibilities to look after their health, to be in control of their health, and to actively contribute to their care. So then the reasonable person who's the patient might be expected to understand that this has been done to them recently, and so nothing has changed since then. So my rule of thumb would be when you're doing something new to a patient that hasn't been done with them before, you would then reasonably need to consider more consent. Thank you, doctor. Okay, this is gonna be the last question for Brad because I know we've got a valuable time with him. There's one more question in the chat facility, Brad, if you don't mind, um, before we close off. Thank you very much. So, so, so the question was, as a chiropractor, do I get consent for each treatment? Uh, for each new condition. And, and so my answer is, if I haven't seen the patient for a period of a year, then yes, I reconsent that patient because the risks to what might be done are different. If, and, and, and there are chiropractors who, who would do dry needling or who would do ultrasound or do shockwave therapy, the first time that they do that with that patient, they would need to get consent for that. If the patient comes in for a new condition, that they hadn't seen the practitioner before before. And this is whether they're a chiropractor, whether they're a physio, whether they're an, uh, a general practitioner. Every time you do a new set of interventions and procedures or treatments, you need to inform the patient because they haven't experienced it before. And if any of you would like to, to, to reach me through Jeanette afterwards through the association, you're more than welcome to do so. I'd like to help you as much as I can. What, what I've learned is as I've done this, and, and, and this is, I've been doing medical legal work in various forms roughly since 2007. I've been in practice uh, since 1996, first patient since 1993. I don't know most stuff. And the longer I'm in practice, the less I know. 
So I'm happy to share with you any time and, and thank you very much for your questions and thanks for your participation in today's discussion. And thank you very much, Brad, for your, your time this evening and for an exceptional presentation. Thank you, Tanya and Dr. Pillay, for facilitating the opportunity to be strategic partners with you. I hope you have a fantastic evening further. Thank you very much.